Welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Chef Alexis Cyclic. She is going to be making some amazing, delicious recipes. But before she does that, she is going to tell you about her experience on the first ever vegan show on the TV Food Network. Please welcome her to the show. It's so nice to meet you. Hi, Chef AJ. It's so great to be here. Yeah. So tell us about that, because that is pretty groundbreaking. Tabitha Brown was the host. How did that whole thing unfold? Yeah. So last year, early around January, February, I had gotten contacted by some of the casting agents for Food Network, and they were looking to create a new plant based kind of chop or chop show to expose people to really more what, of what they can do with plant based cooking. And since I'm very into vegetable forward cooking and I've been doing vegetable forward pop ups for a while, it seemed like it was a perfect fit for me. So I had to go through a little bit of a, an interview process and many phone calls and all that good stuff in order to get cast on the show. But eventually I made it and I partook in one episode. It was the premiere episode and the show was structured like chop. So there were three rounds for our episode. There was an appetizer an entree and a dessert. But for other episodes, there were different challenges for each round, but ours was themed dinner party. So we kind of had the basic structure of appetizer, entree, dessert. And with each challenge, we had to, or with each round, we had to come up with a recipe that catered not only to Top of the Brown being vegan, but to specific guest judges' preferences. So the first round was no citrus, no mushrooms, something that had to be party, an appetizer party-like dish. And then the second round was a judge who didn't really like vegetables at all like international flavor, but really didn't like vegetables. So while it was super broad, we had to really kind of find something interesting to challenge ourselves and to challenge him to really see if he could enjoy plant-based food when he was so used to meat and potatoes. So that was the gist of the show. That is something. Now, since the show has aired, are you allowed to talk about the outcome at all? I can. I can definitely talk about it. Okay. So first of all, how did they find you? So I was contacted through Instagram, which ironically is how I think a lot of people are really getting in touch with uh, potential contestants these days because all of us are presenting ourselves on Instagram and social media and so my food um, is showcased on Instagram a lot all my pop-ups I've been posting um, I've been posting about those events as well so people kind of discovered me through that and then went through the process Wow so that that, that, that is a really really interesting had you ever done a competition show before? I never done a television show. I participated in cooking competitions throughout high school and then a little bit in college as well, but nothing that was nationally broadcast on TV. So that was definitely an eye-opening experience. Because I was on Cupcake Wars and I find it very stressful to do cooking competitions. <laughs> it's definitely more stressful than just cooking at home, but I was fortunate to have a really nice group of contestants that I was competing with. They were a little bit more seasoned. I was my first time, but they had been on a few shows. So they just really want to have a good time. The whole vibe of the show was really to just have fun and showcase your unique approach to vegetables and to vegan plant-based cooking. So it was more about just sharing your love of food versus really getting super competitive with each other. And the whole theme was like a party. As well. How many, how many uh, chefs competed? So there were four in each episode. So six episodes, about 24 chefs, but each Wow. And so they were using all kinds of chefs, not necessarily vegan chefs. Exactly. Yeah, I think... In my episode, there were all, all the other competitors were not vegan. They just had really acclimated to that style of cooking and really loved catering to guest needs in that way. A lot of people were bloggers or caterers too, not necessarily restaurant chefs. So it was really quite broad. And did, did Tabitha Brown also get to taste the food? Because she is the vegan. Yes. Yeah. So Tabitha got to try everything. Also, Manit Shrawan was the other judge. So she was there trying everything and then the guest judges too. So we had a nice panel of three to four judges. And so the judges weren't even vegan necessarily. Manit is not, but Tabitha is. And then the other two might not have been vegan either, but they definitely had to stick with that because the whole thing was to make sure. So who was this day. judge that did not like vegetables? What kind of person is that? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard to imagine that, especially in this world where we all are really obsessed with vegetables. But for someone who just really is, has grown up with like meat and potatoes and that kind of experience the whole time. It's hard for them to adjust, I think, when they're so stuck in their traditions. But vegetables, really, there's so much to do with them that can be even similar to meat and potatoes. The dish that I came up with for that round, I did a cauliflower steak with a chickpea mash and then a muhammara sauce, it's like a ketchup. So you can still create similar style dishes, but unless you're really open to trying them, it's a little bit hard to adapt. 
So how many rounds did you compete in? I made it through the second round. Unfortunately, I my cauliflower steak was not to the liking of the judge who did not like vegetables. So oh, there were three there were three that. rounds in the show. Three rounds, yeah. Appetizer, entree, dessert. So I did not get to do the dessert. You didn't course. get to do dessert, which thankfully you're going to be doing today for us. That is true. Right yeah. Now. What What did you do as your appetizer for the show? So I so I grew up Jewish, and now that is Hanukkah, it's very relevant the dish I made. So I made potato latkes. And so since they had to be gluten-free, I chose to use almond flour as a binder and vegan, no eggs. And so I did a classic potato latke and then a cashew-based uh, sour cream on there. And then since we couldn't use any citrus, I used some dried cherries for a little bit of tart acidity on there as well. And then some scallions for a little bit of extra crunch. And then I also did a little bit of a tomato chutney, a spiced tomato chutney to add some depth and some sweetness instead of the typical applesauce. I want to go a little bit more savory. So I added a spiced tomato chutney on there as well. You know, I'm Jewish as well. And this is Hanukkah. We should have had you making latkes on the show. I know. Next time. I didn't even... So um, one of the viewers who's watching live, Apple says, is Tabitha Brown really that wonderful? She is. Right when we walked on the set, it felt like we were home. Like, it's hard to imagine that because we were all strangers just walking into a set that's staged as a home. But it really felt like we were there to enjoy ourselves and just be welcomed in and share in this lovely dinner party with someone with such great vivacious energy and really a genuine passion for connecting with others. That is cool. So were you nervous? I was not as nervous as I expected to be. It was right in the middle of a busy time at work as well. So I didn't really have too much time to think about it. I just had to fly and just go for it. And so I think being kind of in the moment really helped to just to overcome those nerves that I typically would expect to have. You're an executive chef at a regular restaurant in New York, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm the executive chef at Balabusta in the West Village in the city. That's a cute name. You're so young. It's congratulations. I mean, that's amazing. That you. you're did you go to culinary school? I did. So I attended actually both the Culinary Institute of America and Cornell University School of Hotel Administration. There's a collaborative program between both schools. So I was able to complete two degrees in four years because credits transfer across both programs. That is amazing. So I know that your restaurant is a traditional restaurant, but you mentioned you have a lot of vegan options. Tell us about what they are in the menu and who, who orders these? Is it regular vegans or are other people curious in trying vegan food? Yep. Yeah. So we are an Israeli restaurant and Israeli food is very big on vegetables and plants as well. So we like to showcase those classic vegetables however we can, but also try to put seasonal spins on them and get a little bit more modern. So one dish that we just added to our menu is a delicata squash steak. And so it's a completely vegan dish. The, the, steak it's, the squash steak itself is roasted with a miso harissa glaze. And then we serve it with a nice bean salad with some herbs and some roasted red peppers and some onion, and then a chimichurri sauce as well and a forbidden rice crisp for a little bit of texture. So it's got all these various components with different textures, a lot of different uh, flavor notes as well. So a little spice, a little acidity, a little sweetness. So that it really creates this whole experience, even though you're not eating any meat or cheese or anything else that you typically are looking for when you when you're ordering something. Wow, delicata squash steak sounds amazing. Yes, yeah. And no, today I'm using delicata squash too. I'm a big fan of that. That, that, that sounds so good. How much in culinary school, or at least the one you went to, did they teach people about vegan and plant based cooking, or did they? So I was not really in classes where we were learning about plant-based cooking. I know so many more programs these days are building out um, more education in that, but I was in CIA about eight years ago. And so things were just starting to become more prevalent then, but we were still following a very traditional uh, class path. And since I also was limited in taking additional classes, I really had to go straight through and just take the set classes. There were definitely some vegan dishes that we were exposed to, but it was more like this is just something that you should know about, but not really that important. So it's really nice to see so many more programs these days that have changed. And even CIA too, that's really grown to be more articulate and how they're sharing plant-based cooking with everyone. That's cool. What do, what do they teach? I mean, I, the culinary school I went to was vegan. So we didn't have to you know, like learn how, like if we we're going to be a restaurant, what if somebody orders vegan, but did they teach you anything about just like special diets or allergies or how to accommodate people? Because one of the ways that I eat that a lot of viewers eat, which is, I guess, considered even more extreme than vegan is we don't eat sugar, oil, and salt, which, you know, that's what restaurant food is basically. Yes. Uh, we did take nutrition class. That was kind of the, our biggest um, introduction into uh, eating with a little bit more um, of a stricter diet. But 
it wasn't that much practice with it. I, I did create a dish to challenge myself to kind of be a little bit more limited and it was like a gluten-free and vegan dish, but that was really my only chance to explore it, where I've actually gotten to practice with um, being a little bit more creative in that sense is within my pop-ups. So on the side of working in the restaurant, I host vegetable forward pop-up dinners and I really want to accommodate as many guests as possible. So when they come in with certain allergies or restrictions, I really try to keep the integrity of my dish, but also changes so that they can come and still try everything as well without feeling like they're sacrificing or losing out on the experience of what I'm going for in the first place. Nice. So what are you going to make for us today? So today I'm making two kind of sweeter dishes because I have a really big sweet tooth, but one is savory and then one is meant to be dessert. So the, the first one I'm going to make is a caramel apple soup. I really love during fall and winter uh, finding apples and just playing around with them as much as possible. So this is a take on a caramel apple as a dessert, but really this is becoming a savory dish as a soup. And then the second dish I'm going to make is a macadamia nut crumble bar with a delicata squash jam. And I'm kind of going the opposite route here by taking something that's typically savory, the delicata squash, the delicata squash, and turning it into something sweet. That sounds terrific. A delicata squash, is that available year-round in many places now? It's, it's a bit challenging to find. I, I'll go between Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, but depending on where in the city I am, I can't always find it. So I often go to the farmer's market and I'll see it there. So it's a little bit challenging to find and it comes in and out of the various different stores. Sometimes they'll have it one week and then another week they don't, but it's definitely not as prominent as butternut squash or spaghetti squash. It's for some reason, just a little more difficult to find, but I have one here in case anyone is unfamiliar with kind of how it looks. So it's very understated, but it's got nice colors. So don't really know what you can do with it just by looking at it, but you can eat the skin, which is great on this too. So you don't have to worry about peeling with like butternut squash. You have to be a little bit, you have to spend a little bit more time because the skin is so thick. So delicata squash is nice if you want to just go right away. I am taking the skin off today, but it's something that you can think about. When you're but you definitely it. can eat it. Um, I, I yeah. wonder if, if someone couldn't find it, would there be a substitute like butternut or kabocha? Yeah, I, I like to use sweet potatoes or butternut squash if I can't find delicata squash, but it's kind of, if you're using it in a puree uh, situation, like today I'm using it in a, uh, in a uh, sauce-based like um, si situation. So that'll work well if you had those other squashes to use or sweet potatoes. Nice. Well, it sounds delicious. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get started. I'm going to go kind of back and forth between both of them. And I've done a little prep ahead of time just to, to keep it moving. But so for the caramel apple soup, the first thing I did, I caramelized my onions just with water because there's enough sugar in the onions themselves to cook and to turn them golden brown. So I started over low heat, added just a little bit of water and kept the lid on to help steam the onions and release the, the water and cook them a little bit faster. And so eventually they turned nice and golden brown. And I actually, I took them out of the pot because the next step is I'm going to caramelize the apples themselves. And I really want a nice surface area so that I can get as much color and depth of flavor out of the apples too. So I started that over here. And again, just keeping the lid on to help release the moisture as fast as you can. And so you just want to cook the apples down until they get golden brown and really soft. You want them to almost be... Uh, you don't want them to lose all their texture because you want them to still have some substance and you don't want them to fully just disintegrate. But once they're nice and golden brown, you can add the onions back in. So that's exactly what I'm going to do right now so that we can build the base of our soup. Is there a preferred apple you like to use? So I like to use, I'm a big fan of Envy apples. I like uh, Granny Smith apples and I like Honeycrisp a lot because they've got a really nice balance of tart and sweet. I don't love the softer apples that kind of fall apart as well. They just don't seem to, to build as much caramelization when you cook with them. Envy is my favorite apple. Yeah, and the color on those two, when you peel the skin, there's still the nice red on the outside. So it really just adds another element to the dish. Those are the ones I have today, the Envy apples. And so now in my pot, I have my onions and my apples. And so I'm going to add a sachet, which is basically, I have some herbs and spices in a cheesecloth so that it's a little bit easier for removal later. So I have in here some thyme, some oregano, and some star anise and some cinnamon. So some classic fall winter flavors. I'm just going to put right in the pot. And then we're going to add some water to, um, just for the, for the liquid. And if you have vegetable broth around, you can certainly add that but I like to keep the flavor of the onions and the apples really pure and not allow anything else to get in the way. So that's why I like to stick just with water for this soup. 
and you want to add a little bit more. You want to add enough to cover it and then a little bit more because you're not, you, you don't want the, you don't want the water to cook down too much. And then you have to add clean water at the end. So you want to make sure that as it's boiling, you're still not losing too much. And that when you just blend it, you'll have the perfect texture. And you're also not adding any more liquid, any cream, obviously, because this is a vegan dish, uh, but even coconut milk or almond milk or anything, we're not adding that because the onions and the apples, once you blend them, they create enough of a creamy texture that you won't even realize that you don't have anything else in there. So my water now is there and I'm just gonna let it come up to a simmer. And once it, or once it comes to a boil, I'll let it simmer and I'll keep the lid on just so we can keep as much flavor in as possible as it's cooking. So we, while that's working over there, we're gonna start on the macadamia nut crumble. Mm. So I roasted the delicata squash already. And so I basically, you, I cut off the ends, I scooped out the seeds and then roasted it in the oven face down so that you could get a nice golden brown color on some of the skin, on some of the flesh. And we're gonna scoop it out. It's very soft now, it's very pliable. You can just kind of uh, scoop it right away. So you could just eat that. It's so good. Yeah, I know. It's delicious. Super sweet. The little touch of nuttiness as well. So really yummy. So I'm just going to scoop that out and yeah, we're going to season it. I was going to say that's hard. interesting that you're, you know, because a lot of times I, when I was a chef at a restaurant, I was a pastry chef, but it seems like a lot of chefs specialize either in desserts or more like entrees. It seems like you're able to do both. I definitely am more of a savory chef, but when I can, I like to play around with desserts too, because I have such a sweet tooth. I really want to be able to, to cater for myself whenever I can, but it's also really useful to know different um, techniques as well, because you can apply them in savory cooking or sweet cooking, depending on what you're doing with either one. Nice. Yeah. So this filling, I'm just scooping it out and then we're going to season it up with some Ceylon, which is date syrup. And you can either make your own or you can buy that. They sell it at Trader Joe's now, but it's a really nice natural sweetener and it's never too overpowering either. It's got a nice rich color and a lot of depth of flavor. I love date syrup. Do you have a preferred brand? So the one at Trader Joe's, I actually really enjoy using because it's just very pure in its flavor. So that's kind of where I go. It's in my budget as well. So it's nice to use that one. But when I can, I actually do prefer to make it on my own because there's even more intensity to it. And the color becomes like a, it's not just a dark brown, but it's got a nice purple hue to it as well. And then you get some extra dates that you could work with as well. And you, you can use those in some other form of cooking or baking too. So there's kind of a two in one there. I used to make my own like, like over 11 years ago, but then when I Love Date Lady came out with an organic one, it just didn't seem worth it anymore. Yeah, I mean, it is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. And if you can't use the dates, you kind of don't know what to do with it. So it's nice when you don't have to make it on your own. So I have my squash um, right here, just in the bowl. And now I'm gonna add to it the ceylon and a little bit of vanilla extract as well. How do you feel about vanilla powder? I sometimes like it, sometimes I don't. Kind of depends on my mood and what kind of form of vanilla flavor I'm going for. I often don't even like to do vanilla flavor because I feel like it can, even though there are some great ones out there, it doesn't always taste as natural as I want it to. And I like to just let the flavors of everything else shine. So don't always go for the powder. Interesting. So for, for the squash here, so you can just keep it nice and plain and just add the ceylon and the vanilla, but I like a lot of texture in my cooking and I also want to add a little more sweetness to this dessert. So I have some dried cherries that we're just going to mix right in. And then also I have some no sugar dark, dark chocolate chips because I'm a big chocolate fan as well. And what, that'll melt. what brand are you using? This brand, I do not remember which one I grabbed today, but I usually... I, I like to just go as simple as possible. The Hershey's brand, actually. I like to use the Hershey's no sugar dark chocolate. I did not know they had one. Yeah, they do have one. I like to use those. And so I'm mixing this in. Um, and so you can see it's nice and creamy. Here, the angle is not so great, but it's got a nice purple color now from the date syrup. And we're just gonna mix this 
and set it aside because maybe lower your camera just a little bit because ah, yeah, yeah it's cutting it's cutting it off thanks yeah, yeah perfect oh beautiful so, yeah so the date syrup really turns it into this beautiful purple color we're going to set that aside for just a second and now we're going to make the crust so i'll keep the angle down a little so for what i have here is some crushed macadamia nuts <coughs> So they're from, they're not into a powder. They're just crushed until they're fine because we still want that texture. So we're going to add it right into the bowl. I also have some almond flour here. I'm going to add that in. Some rolled oats. Adding those. And I have some brown ginger. I'm going to add that in. I have a little baking powder. Add that right in. And then I've got some more silan for this. So we're gonna scoop that right in there. And then I'm just gonna add a little bit of water to help bind. And with this recipe, you can't be afraid to get messy because, so sorry, I know the angle is not great. Here you go. So with this recipe, you can't be afraid to get messy. I like to start mixing with my hands because it's really the best way to make sure you're incorporating everything and that it sticks together. So I'm just gonna mix this until it holds together. And then we'll spread it out and bake it. And with this too, if you aren't a huge fan of ginger, you could add various different spices. I like to work with cinnamon and coriander a lot. So those would definitely go well in this. And it's not too messy. It's not, it's just sticky enough. But if you have children and you want them to be involved in the baking, this is definitely a great recipe for them to participate in. So it's pretty much, it holds together now and I'm gonna line it in a baking pan. So. You mentioned in your recipe, which guy, by the way, guys, I'm putting in the show notes now, uh, an onion called cipollini. I don't think I've heard yes. of that. What is it? How is it different? Is it, is it necessary? Is it better? So you don't need cipollini for this, um, for the soup, but I like them for pickling because they're nice and small and they're easy to work with and just cut into pieces. So for, for the soup, for the garnish, I wanted something that was easy. So cipollini's, they're round and flat and they're nice and sweet as well. So going with that same sweet flavor profile, I thought it'd be a good addition. But if you don't have cipollini's, you can certainly work with uh, sweet onions, Vidalia onions, like white onions, those classic ones. You could even use red onions as well. They're just gonna add a little, a little bit of a different flavor note to it. You could add shallots too. Any onion works, it's just, I wanted to bring out that onion flavor because it's a caramel apple and onion soup. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to um, the, the crumble now. And so I have just a parchment lined baking sheet right here. I will lower the camera again. And so we're going to spread not all of the crumble on the bottom, but maybe two thirds of it because we still want to have a little on the top. And this is just an eight by eight baking pan here. And you want a nice layer on the bottom. And again, working with your hands is the easiest way. Just filling in all the corners right now. And if you don't have parchment and you have foil, that will work just fine to line the bottom of the pan. And so it's probably about a quarter inch thick. The, the whole layer on the bottom. And so it just looks like this, nice and flat. And then we're gonna add our filling here. And we're gonna use all of the filling and spread it just completely across this layer. For this, I would recommend a spoon or a spatula. It's a little messy now. Just spread it evenly across. Cool. Sure, the cherries and the chocolate chips get spread out well too. You don't want them stuck in one place, but you'll have a nice lump of chocolate. And then, there we go. so completely covering the the base, and then we're just going to take the rest of the crumble and put it on top for a little bit more texture. So just spread it around. You can keep some pieces a little bit larger in their lumps and some a little more broken up. Sprinkle it all across. 
And you still want a little bit of that color peeking through, but you do want it to also be a nice surprise. So cover most of the top and it'll look like this. And then we're gonna bake it in a 350 degree oven for about 20 minutes to start and we'll see where we're at. So I'll put that in while we're continuing with the conversation in the soup. You know, I'm, I'm uh, uh, Chef Alexis, I'm posting yes. your recipes for caramelized apple soup. It says A-N water. What does that mean? Yes. A-N. So I like to do oh, as, as needed. needed. Exactly. Oh, got it. So yes. I'm going to type is as needed then because I didn't. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Thank because sometimes the apples are all different sizes, the onions. So it's hard to specify exactly how much. But if you go by the range of just got enough it. to cover a little Thank more. Exactly. That's an effort. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about syncopated and how do you have time to do pop-ups if you're the executive chef of a busy restaurant? So I have not been doing as many pop-ups lately because I am in this new role, but when I was still a sous chef, it was a lot easier to find a little bit of extra time. But I really like to, to challenge myself and to, to explore um, different ingredients and spices and flavor profiles and themes on my own and present myself as much as possible out there. So I took the time to create this brand of syncopated which not only focuses on my love of cooking but also my love of dancing and drumming i grew up at, in a very artsy world and that this the idea of syncopation and just kind of being creative and a little bit offbeat here and there is something that really inspired me in my dancing and my drumming and so i thought it was a perfect way to tie into my style of cooking where i like to be a little out there with vegetables and spices and kind of combining different things that you wouldn't necessarily expect and then sharing them in a way that's definitely approachable, but also exposing you to something entirely new at the same time. Wow. I knew you were a dancer because you wrote a book uh, uh, called A Taste of the Nutcracker, where you combined yes. your love of cooking and dancing. But I had no idea you were a drummer. Yes, I don't do it as much these days now, but I grew up, I was playing uh, in a jazz band. I was in a band at school as well with my friends. And I, I bought a cajon recently, so I can still practice in a New York friendly, a New York City apartment in a friendly way. It's not too noisy. So I really like to tap into exploring rhythms and all that. I like to tap dance as well. So that love of musicality and rhythms is always there. Nice. Did you always want to be a chef? I did. My mom grew up in the hospitality world and she was always into traveling and sales and marketing, just the love of cooking and food. And at a young age, I got an easy bake oven, kind of fell in love with that from the start. And yeah. And so that's what kind of led me down this path. And I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to stage at some restaurants at a young age. My mom was working at a French restaurant locally. So I got to spend some time in the kitchen there. I spent time at a local hotel and eventually attended a vocational program as my a vocational culinary program for high school. So I really was able to get in, get my foot in the door and really get some great exposure while growing up and still trying to figure everything out. Wow. That's amazing. Cause you're, you've got your, I mean, you're young, you've got a whole huge, who knows your future ahead of you. You know, you might want to tell the story about how you got to be on the show because 99% of the time a guest is referred by another guest, but you came in through a different channel. Your dad actually wrote us. Yeah. So my dad and my mom, they together. So they, well, my mom herself, she has been following um, your journey. Uh, uh, she's been on her own health journey since her uh, mom had passed away several years ago. And she really wanted to transform how her and my dad were eating to just live a better lifestyle. And she had introduced my sisters and I also to what you vouch for and just a different approach to eating and really living a more healthy lifestyle. And so she's been sharing with us a ton of your information and her and my dad have connected as well over um, different recipes that you have and different guests and really just opening ourselves up to a whole new world of eating. And when the show came out, my mom thought it'd be great to reach out to you and kind of share um, share what was happening on a, on a larger scale in regards to vegans and plant-based eating. And so that's how we got connected through my parents. And that's very here. cool. It's a very cool yeah. story. Oh, yeah. That's, that's awesome. very exciting. I hope more people can watch your show. Cause it, we, as we discussed, unless, I mean, if they have network television, I guess they can watch it easier. Yes, that is true. But it is on discovery. Plus if you, if there's a free trial, I know, but if you have an account or if a friend has an account, you can certainly just use theirs and check out the show. It sounds great. That's amazing. yeah. Yeah. Other than the book that you have now, do you ever think you'll write like a, a book of all your recipes? I think I, I would love to. So the first cookbook I wrote was self-published during the pandemic. So it was my first foray into, into writing on a really professional level, level and having to test out recipes in my parents' home and take pictures all independently. It's definitely a task for sure, but I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to do it all myself and to learn and to write and edit and go through that whole process because now once I do it on a grander scale, I feel like I'll have 
just a more of a connection and understanding of everything that goes into it. So I'd love to definitely try and do that once I have a little bit more experience, more recipes to share with everyone. I'm guessing it's Monday. That might be your day off as a chef. Yes, today is my my one day off. But fortunately, with the holidays being on a Saturday this year, we get Sunday and Monday off the coming weeks. So that's a nice benefit. But most of the time, it's split days off. So, but Mondays are guaranteed, which I love. And it's a really hard work. I yeah. Did it. Yeah. People say, "Oh, why don't you open a restaurant?" I'm like, eh, "No, <laughs> you have yeah, to really, it's really, yeah, it's certainly challenging for sure." Yeah. Cool. So you know, I'm just, I'm going to move on to just one more step so I can just move through the next process while we're still chatting. So I'm going to actually pickle the cipollinis. So I have them cut right here already. I quartered them. And for pickling liquids, you can keep them super simple or get really um, complicated depending on your mood. And so since the onions are just part of the soup here and just for a little bit, bit of texture and acidity, the flavor isn't super strong because it's going to get lost amongst the, the delicious depth in the soup. But I just wanted a little acidity to come through. So I've got some apple cider vinegar here, a little bit of lemon juice, and then just some water so that it's not too strong in its acidity. And I'm just going to put the onions right in as well and just bring it up to a boil and let it cook a little bit so that they can absorb um, all the intense acidity and citrus notes as they're cooking. But you want them to just get a little bit soft. You still want them to have a crunch so that when you're eating the soup, you have more than just the, the velvety soup to enjoy, but you have a little bit of the onion texture as well. So I'll just keep that cooking on the side. And then I also have another garnish component. So I have a, a honey crisp apple here and I really like to roast apples. So I know people often like to eat them fresh because they've got that great crunch and refreshing note, but I actually really like to roast apples because it just intensifies their sweetness a little bit more in a very natural way and gives them a cool chewy texture. So I'm gonna just cut them into large chunks and roast them so that we can add that to the soup too. So here I'm just gonna cut around the core and you wanna keep them on the larger side, the pieces, because as they shrink, they, they, as, they, as they cook, they're gonna lose their water and they're gonna shrink. So if you cut them too small, they're just gonna become very soft and kind of disappear. So I have them in large cubes basically. And I like to keep the skin on as well. It adds a nice bit of color to the soup. So I just, I'm gonna cut these and then I'm gonna put them on a tray with a silk hat because they can stick sometimes. So using a silk hat just helps to prevent the, the apples from sticking as they are cooking. So I just have right here and just plain on the tray. You can season them with some cinnamon or other spices. Roll Remember, spice we, we, we gotta be able to see. Yeah, good, lift it up. Right, Thank you. Oh, yeah. beautiful. I love silk hats. I mean, I, one of mine lasted like 30 years. I'm not kidding. Yeah, no, they're great. Easy to clean, easy to work with. So right here, and then I'm just gonna put it in the oven for maybe five to six minutes right now, and then we'll check them out and see where we're at. And then I have just one more garnish for the soup. So as you can see, I'm a really big fan of texture in various different forms. And so I have the, the soft crunch from the, the onions, and then I got the chewiness from the apples. And then the last thing I have here are hazelnuts. You could use any nut if you're not a fan of hazelnuts. Almonds work fine, pecans, but I just really like hazelnuts with it. And you can keep them whole or just cut them in half. I like to cut them in half just so that they're a little bit more uh, palatable, easier to enjoy with the soup. And then I'm just gonna roast them for just a few minutes to give them a little bit more of a nuttiness and a golden brown color. And so the soup is now, it's definitely at a simmer, uh, at a boil, so I'm gonna lower it and we'll just let it simmer. And it's basically almost done once we, once it's cooked for about a half hour, 45 minutes, we'll take out the sachet. We wanna make sure we don't blend in that cheesecloth and the cinnamon sticks and everything. And we'll just blend it to finish and then top it with all the garnishes. So very easy to get done in a quick amount of time. What did they teach you in culinary school about oil? Like, because it, they use so much of it in restaurants. Yes. So what we, we learn in school is really what oil is best for what element of cooking. So you learn that extra virgin olive oil is good for seasoning because it doesn't have a high smoke point and it's got a really intense flavor. So you learn to work with that in dressings and just kind of finishing applications. 
And then for frying, you learn about canola oil and uh, um, different blended oil as well. So not extra virgin olive oil, but olive oil. And you kind of basically just learn how to use it in what application instead of, and you don't actually learn how to not use it and what else you can do instead. So it's basically like what works best with what oil so that you're as familiar as possible with applying it versus not applying it. Interesting. What do they teach you about salt? Salt is very much, again, how to use salt in the best way to enhance flavor. I've learned as I've worked um, over the years and developed my own style of cooking that salt, while it definitely can bring out flavors, it often covers up flavors as well. Whether or not you're using a good amount or too much, it often takes away from the natural elements and natural flavors that you're trying to highlight. So you learn that there's obviously like kosher salt is very popular. There's molten salt, which is often used as a finishing salt because it's got a nice flaky texture. And that's just a little bit of that uh, briny note to finish at the end. But that's all about how the salt enhances the dish versus how the, the natural elements of the vegetables and the flavors and or whatever else, fruits and legumes and anything else that you're working with. You can still use those and different combinations to really enhance a flavor note just in a different way maybe. But we're taught to, to apply salt in as many ways as possible, that makes the most sense. Yeah. Which obviously is not what we're doing here in this situation. Right. Yeah. I, I think this concept of not cooking with sugar oil salt to most restaurants and chefs is just very uh, bizarre. Yes, it is. And those ingredients are also very cheap. So they're very fast ways to enhance. And here's obviously olive oil and refined oils can certainly cost more because there's a lot more involved in that but the, the classic blends of oils are all very accessible and they make it that way so that you're enticed to use it a little bit more as well too. Yeah. There's only a couple of restaurants, at least that I'm aware of in the United States that don't cook with sugar oil salt. Yeah, it's hard to find. And even if you, you ask if there's maybe, maybe there's one dish here or there, but for the most part, there's always gonna be some element of salt. I feel like more than sugar or anything else because yeah. it's just your go-to ingredient. Like right. we're taught to always set up the station with salt and black pepper often too. Not so much in, it depends on what cuisine you're in for the black pepper situation, but that's where I started with salt and pepper to season everything. I'm very sure. basic, very generic. There's well, a lot more. We're going to have to start a culinary school where this is taught. <laughs> yeah. And then all the chefs from all the restaurants can at least take one class and just learn how to have one dish on their menu. Yeah. No, and I'm very fortunate to work at uh, an Israeli restaurant where spices are super prevalent. And for me, that's great because I, I always like working with spices, but because they can enhance the dish in so many different ways. There's so many unique combinations. They're also very vibrant in color. So you can really transform a dish with spices and really develop uh, layers of flavor that you might not expect, especially with different peppers and heats and things like that and the intensities of bitterness and sweetness too within spices. So there's a lot to work with there, which is very cool. Yeah. Do, do you find like, is a chef, you like, you're, you're always tasting your food all day. Is that hard? Cause that like, as a pastry chef, you don't have to do that because you know, you're basically replicating the same thing and it's pretty foolproof, you know, like when you're following a, a dessert recipe, but with, with, you know, I mean, that would drive me crazy to have to do that all day. Yeah, it's definitely, it can become overwhelming sometimes and just kind of numbing for the palate in a sense, because you're tasting often so many things so often, but it's really important to, especially in a restaurant setting, if you want to keep things consistent, because even if you have standardized recipes, sometimes the one, one chef might cook something a little bit different or they might measure something a little bit different one day. The ingredient itself might not always be perfect either and consistent. So you always have to trust your taste buds more than anything because even if something looks right, it might be spoiled. Or even if it's a finished product too, you have to verify that it hasn't gone bad or anything. So you constantly have to, to do that extra step. But if you love eating and cooking, it's, yeah. it's enjoyable because you just get to try all those amazing flavors all the time. I love that. Trust your taste buds. Yeah. yeah I always like to teach my cooks to trust their gut in regards to just cooking and their minds um, and using their, their inspiration and their intuition when they're getting creative. But trusting your taste buds is the same thing, because if you don't trust your gut, you got to try it. And then you'll, you'll be able to know a little bit more about what's going on. Yeah. Well, trusting you're going to, th I don't think chefs should smoke because the, uh, the two chefs that I've known in my whole life that smoked their food, all you could taste was black pepper, because I think that their taste buds were numbed from smoking that they couldn't yes. taste correctly. And I remember these two chefs in my life and it's like, all I taste is black pepper. It just tastes terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I smoking for sure can, can mute the palate in different ways. 
especially when you're in a place that has so, such vibrant flavors like ours too, like it's really important to have a, a clean, a clean sense of understanding of what you're enjoying because those the, the spices are so nuanced and the levels of heat as well. Because we have we have numerous sa sauces that might be all be red and have different le levels of spice and um, a little bit of nuttiness or something else here and there. But if you just look at them, they kind of look the same. So you really have to be able to, to understand what each one has going on and be able to uh, experience that on your own to know what's making each dish work. Yeah. Do you have a favorite chef movie? Honestly, I'm a big fan of Ratatouille. That's my That's favorite one of, movie of all time. One of my favorites. Oh my God, I have a display of, that is hilarious. Yeah. I love that I am so much. Being in New York and with rats and mice, definitely very prevalent in the city. It's ironic that I love that kind of a movie, but it's just really well done. And it's really, um, really cathartic in some ways because it's just, it goes through a lot of the emotions of a chef, but it's also really playful and familiar. But I'm also a big fan of The 100 Foot Journey. I think that one's on a completely different level of, I mean, Ratatouille is obviously about a professional chef, but it's animated. So it's less, it's got a different structure than 100 Foot Journey, which really takes you on this emotional journey and got some incredible actors in there and some beautiful scenery. So the whole experience of that movie and the delicious food they create really something that was really memorable and inspiring to me. Nice. What do you think of people that salt their food before they even taste it? That is something that, that I really am not a fan of. I hate when, when we're making family meal or even when I'm at a restaurant and people, they just, they know what they expect that they want salt before they even know what it tastes like. And yes, there's often times that people under season and they're familiar with how, uh, how a chef cooks, but the, like we're, we talked about before, salt necessarily isn't the flavor that you want to showcase. So if you cover it with salt, then you're not going to taste what's lying underneath or you're going to just kind of ruin the dish sometimes. So Thank it's not you. something I enjoy. Thank yeah, you. no, it's all about trusting the taste buds and tasting all the time. You have to start with tasting. You can never assume. That Maybe that could be the name of your next book. Trust the taste buds. Yeah, it's not a bad idea at all. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check my, my things in the oven while we're still talking. I hope your parents are watching since they're the ones that uh, recommended you. Yes, I know my mom is. My dad is at work, but I'm sure he'll check it out later. Oh, Mrs. Cyclic. You have a lovely daughter. We've got just a few more minutes left on everything that's in the oven and the onions have been cooking for a little while. So I'm going to let them just uh, cool for a little bit. I'm going to take them out of the liquid and just let them cool while we're um, finishing up the soup and everything else. So you, you, are, you have a very lean physique. Is that from your history as a dancer? Because isn't it hard sometimes as a chef to, to maintain leanness? So it is definitely challenging, especially when you're surrounded by a lot of sugar and salt and fat, but I, I am very big on working out and dancing still when I can. So I prioritize that for sure to, to not just to be able to eat a variety of things, but also just to feel really good and be in shape. A kitchen is a very challenging environment and you have to be very physically capable to, to um, just to move around well, to, to work with your coworkers. We go up and down stairs a lot, but also just to handle the heat basically. Well, that's where they get the saying, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. <laughs> exactly. It's, it has so many different levels to it, but it's really true. It just, there's so much going on. You got to stay hydrated too, drink a lot of water. So many normal elements of, of living your best life really come into play in the kitchen because you're in high pressure all the time. So you really need to take care of yourself in order to, to be able to take care of everyone else. Yeah. You seem like you're not the kind of uh, executive chef that yells at her employees, like some other chefs who we won't mention. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is very true. I've really like to, to be a chef that can relate to my cooks and to really set a, a strong example of running a kitchen in a, in a positive way, an optimistic way, but also in a really creating a strong family vibe and a team effort too. For me, it's all about keeping calm under pressure, but also really relating well to everyone. I think that if the front of house gets along with the back of house, no matter who makes a mistake or if something goes wrong, it's all about just coming together as a team in the end and really we're serving other people and serving guests and we want to share with them the best experience that we can. So if you let things get in the way from, and like, it's all about the food in the end. And if you let the drama get in the way or something else it takes away from that. And we're all there because we love food. So we want to just keep that idea at the forefront and just, we want to have a good time as well. And keeping our spirits up and kind of that stress level down really helps to just create a fun environment that we look forward to coming to every single day. You know, at the culinary school I went to, one of the models was it's not what you can make, it's what you can fix. Did you ever find that to be true for any of your creations that maybe sometimes a mistake turned out to be 
wonderful because you were able to create something even better from it. Definitely. Actually, the, the delicata squash crumble bar that we're making today, it started out as a completely different concept in my mind. I wanted to make, I think it was like a, a jam cookie. I was trying to make the, the filling as like a jam and then do a cookie base, but I couldn't get the right type of ingredients. And I wanted it to be gluten-free and nut-free as well. It was inspired by one of the recipes, or this was for one of the recipes in the cookbook. And so I needed it to be something that could be replicated by other people as well. And I just couldn't get a good base. So I, it was late, late at night. I just kind of sat down with my mom. I was trying to brainstorm and figure it out. We talked it through and I was like, you know what? Let's just try this crumble bar. Turned out to be one of the best ideas I had. And I use this dessert all the time. So you kind of have to just go with the flow too. And same thing kind of in service. I keep that same mentality, go with the flow and just move through everything. No obstacle is too large. If you just stay positive and keep a smile and just try to try to work through anything. That's great. Here's a wonderful question from Susanna, a live viewer. What is your process for creating a new recipe? And are there any suggestions for us non-chefs to do that? Yeah. So my process is really to get inspired by my surroundings. So I obviously like to have some sort of idea in mind. And I like to have a theme, like with my pop-up dinners, I like to start with, okay, here, I'm going to do a theme. So the first time I did when I did sweetness of summer, so I knew, uh, again, I always have that sweet tooth. So I knew I wanted summer ingredients, but I also really like my cooking to be very personal. So I wanted to tap into different elements of my life. So I started by then thinking about what I wanted to showcase through this dinner in regards to my life. And then I went to the farmer's market and looked for what ingredients were stood out to me and what I felt connected to. So I really try to find things that make sense in the story of my cooking. I don't just like to put something on a dish because it looks good or it sounds good. I want every component to have meaning and also for me to be as personal as possible. But when I'm at the restaurant and I'm creating, not, I'm still creating in a personal way, but I'm creating for a broader audience and for working with a, a chef owner as well. So we have more people involved. It's about um, collaboration and really just getting feedback from other people as well. So you have to learn in the kitchen to not be so stubborn. Sometimes I definitely can have that stubborn note to myself, but when you're serving other people and you have so many different opinions around you, you really have to open up your ears and listen to that because even someone who is less experienced or from the front of house, they might have just a different knowledge or a different perspective that can really be eye-opening to you as how you're creating a dish. So while you certainly, or for me, I really want something to be my own sometimes, but it can be even better if you just take, it, take time to, to get a little bit more feedback and create something that's bigger than yourself in the end. Nice. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to take my apples out. I think they're almost there. So they look pretty much the same. They're not going to get much color, but you just want it when you feel them, you just want them to have a little bit of a give. And as they're on the tray, they'll cool a little bit more as well. So it's been, uh, since my oven's at 350 for the, the crumble, it's taking a little bit longer, but you can raise your oven to 400 and it'll go a little bit faster and they'll just be a little bit softer, faster, basically. So I'm going to let those cool over there. I'm going to check my crumble as well. See how we're doing. So with the crumble, you want to make sure that it gets golden brown. And we're, we're almost there. I'm going to I'll tilt it. So we've got a few more minutes on that. But the, the filling itself just needs to set a little bit. It does, it's already cooked, so you don't have to worry about anything in regards to a raw ingredient in any way. It's just making sure it's got some nice color so that when you cut it, it pulls together as well. This might not be true at your restaurant being an Israeli restaurant, but like in more of a standard restaurant, it's so hard to get enough vegetables for people that, you know, like, like, so in my world, like I eat vegetables twice a day and I eat a pound and it's not as much food as you think, especially, you know, like when, when I roast Brussels sprouts and a pound, it's like this much food. It's not an egregious amount of food, but when you go to a restaurant and say order like an order of asparagus, it's like three spears or six spears. Mm -hmm. How is that a serving? Yeah, it's definitely not. And it's funny too, because vegetables are not super expensive. Yes, they can be depending on where you're sourcing them from and organic often does cost more, but in the end, animal proteins tend to be a, a higher price range and people expect them to be higher as well. And they expect to pay more for them. So vegetables shouldn't like, you should be able to, you, the, the profit margin should be um, less because you should be able to sell so many more. At, like you can give such a larger portion for the same cost and we should be able to charge the same amount basically as proteins because of the nutrients that you're getting from that. It's a larger portion portion as well. 
So instead of kind of diluting the price point, you should be able to raise it and give a huge portion because it's not costing you much more. And it's probably adding so much more to the dish too. For me, I, so I worked at restaurants. I, I worked at a vegetable restaurant and then I worked at a Swedish restaurant and now I'm at Bella Busta. So I've definitely been exposed to places where vegetables are the star of the meal and then where they're in the backdrop or in the background. But I've realized, and this is why I cook this way, is that the vegetables and protein, uh, vegetables and fruits and all the produce and plants is really what creates the, the go-to flavor and like the standout flavor of a dish. If you swap out a fish for another fish, yes, it's going to be a little bit different in its nuance, but you can easily do it. But what changes the dish is if you switched out broccoli for tomatoes or cauliflower for zucchini, like that's really where the flavor is. And so that's what I like to, to stick with. Because Thank, thank you for nice. saying that because all the flavor comes from vegetables. Think of all the sauces, yeah. you know, ketchup, barbecue sauce, mustard, I don't know, whatever people use, vinegars, it, this flavors come from plants. Nobody makes a sauce yes. out of meat or fish, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. For me, that's more fun to work with too. Yes. Like people, I, I understand that there are various cuts of meat and people find that they each, um, they each contribute different notes and things like that. But to me, there's just so much more to do with a vegetable, with each component of a vegetable too. Like uh, you can work with, uh, in, in the cookbook, I have a recipe with the broccoli florets and then the broccoli stalks as well. So you can use all the different parts and they each add something new to a dish. So you just gotta, gotta open up your mind a little bit more, get a little bit more creative. Even uh, when I was at Dirt Candy, we had a dessert that had onions in there and then an onion skin as well. So that was something that was very unfamiliar to me eating the onion skin, but with vegetables, you're often trying to use all the parts in as many ways as possible. I came up with a dish that utilized beet greens, beet skin, um, the beets themselves, then the pickling liquid from the beets afterwards. So you just, there's actually so much that you can do if you kind of keep um, exploring deeper. Are there any ingredients you don't love and don't love to work with in the plant kingdom? Like for me, so, like, yeah, just. I have a few. I'm not a huge fan of bitter flavors. I mean, <laughs> again, it always comes back to that. I love sweets. So bitter for me is something that I'm becoming more comfortable working with. And obviously uh, as a chef, I am familiar with how to, how to enhance its flavor profile, but I'm not a big fan of bitter greens. So those are not something that I typically like to use, but I enjoy eating them when they're balanced out by other fruits nuts sometimes, or some other things that add different texture. And one other ingredient I'm not a fan of is coconut. Oh, I, really, I like coconut milk, but shredded coconut, that texture really bothers me. And then such a strong flavor that I really, I like nuts and most nuts, but coconut, and I know coconut's not a nut, but I like that kind of nutty flavor from everything else and coconuts, just for me, they don't work so well. Oh, good to know. Yeah. But if you were on a competition show and they were the ingredients, you'd have to use them. Yes, for sure. I am not opposed to, to being challenged in any way. And I really like to, to try to uh, encourage myself to like something, just it hasn't worked yet with coconut, but I'm trying as much as I can. <laughs> Do you have a favorite chef, either real or TV? So I, I was fortunate enough to stage at Anissa with Chef Anita Lowe in the city several years ago. And she is one of my favorite chefs to work with and just to, to get to know and to, to follow, um, follow along. She was someone who's super down to earth. Her restaurant was very similar to something that I hope to, I aspire to, to create one day. It was a small restaurant in the West Village. It was refined, but very personalized. And each dish told a real story. It was a small kitchen. She was present a lot of the time and she never wanted to lose sight of what that restaurant was. She didn't have a whole empire restaurant. She really had Anissa as her focus and did as much as she could to really make that something beautiful. And just the playfulness of it too, I really liked because she was a savory chef, but then also had desserts in the menu too. And nothing was out of the ordinary or um, too, too technical anyway. It was just really well done and really refined and flavor and concept and really homey in its overall um, impact on you as well. So there's so much there that I just really connected with and that I hope to one day do for myself. Unfortunately, her restaurant's not there anymore, but I still get to run into her here and there. She is in the West Village now and she is very present in the food world. So it's great to reconnect when I can. People are asking about onion skins. You can actually use the skin of the onion. I mean, I've used them to make broth, but I've never eaten them. Yeah. So at Dirt Candy, we had a dessert where they were actually candied. And so unfortunately in that situation, they were using sugar. So it kind of created a, a texture that made it a little bit more palatable, but they were cooked down so much. And you can still um, cook them in a similar way and cook them and puree them potentially. But what I actually like to do with skins of vegetables is I like to char them a lot 
and create an ash with them to get a nice smoky flavor. So in the, the beet dish that I mentioned earlier, I use the beet skin to create a beet charcoal, a beet ash. And then same with onion skins. I like to, to cook it really high temperature to burn it basically. And there'll still be a hint of maybe the beet or the onion flavor in there, but it really just creates a nice smokiness and char that you can add, use as a color or just to add a little bit um, of a different kind of flavor to a dish. Nice. What three plant ingredients will we always find in Chef Alexis's refrigerator? So I would like to say that I am a big fan of cauliflower, though I did not go so well on the show. I really do like cauliflower because you can, it's got some sweet notes to it. So I love to caramelize cauliflower and create a nice puree with it. I love to roast it, season it with some lemon, um, some, some pine nuts as well. So actually Meyer lemon, I would say I've seasoned with Meyer lemon and Meyer lemon is another ingredient that I love to have when it's in season. It's a little bit more floral and it's citrus notes and not as, uh, not as pungent. So I really like Meyer lemon. And then another one would be persimmons, which also mm. a little bit hard to find, but persimmons are one of my favorite, uh, favorite fruits to use. I love to make a persimmon bread with it, but I also really love to make persimmon butter and serve that with latkes. That's really delicious. I also like to just eat them fresh or I like to grill them or sear them. So persimmons, my lemons and cauliflower you create a great dish with all three of those. Nice. Well, we got a special viewer watching live. I believe it's your mother. If her name is Michelle, because she's got the same yes. last name. Mm -hmm. She must be, well, since you said you were Jewish, she must be felling at how successful you are at such a young age. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm going to take out my crumble now because it's all done. So it's basically got a nice golden brown color here. It smells delicious. I wish I could share it with you. Me and too, so, that's amazing. Yeah, so you can either serve it straight in a pan like this, or you can cut it into squares or into triangles, whatever you desire. Uh, if you want to serve it just plain like this too, this is how I recommend it. It's great to take as a snack on the go or just to enjoy at the end of the night or in the middle of the day. But if you like to have uh, whipped cream with baked goods and crumbles or, or ice cream as well, you can certainly find a vegan ice cream and serve it with that. Or even a uh, sorbet would be great too, because it just adds a little bit nice of a, a colder element. I like to serve it warm too, but adding something a little bit refreshing and cooling is nice to, to contrast that, um, contrast it with the texture. Well, it was delicious side. And then the soup is basically done as well because I can smell it. It's been cooking for a while. And so I can quickly blend that just to show you kind of the final product. So let me just set up my blender really fast. So you're not going to use a stick blender, huh? No. So because the onions are a little bit stringy, I like to use the regular blender. You can certainly use a stick blender, but for me, just because I really like that smooth texture, I like to just uh, use a regular blender if you have that around. So I won't blend all of it. It will take a little bit of time, but I'll blend a little to show you how it looks in the end. Does your family live close? Because who else is who's going to eat it if they're not near? Uh, it's for now just me. I'm going to save it. And hopefully when my parents come for uh, next week during Christmas time, I can share some with them. But they don't live in New York. They, they do. They live, well, they live in New Jersey. So they're, they're close. That's by. close enough. Close. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So I, I made sure to avoid my sachet and with the herbs and spices. And so just going to be careful because it is hot and it can explode. So you just want to be careful if you are blending this way. Just take your time, make sure the lid is on and start slow. I am going to add just a little bit more onions to this because uh, I'm not blending it all at once. I want to just make sure the texture is perfect for you. So I'm just going to add a little bit more and not as much broth this time, some onions and apples. And this is a soup you would serve hot? Yes, I would definitely serve it hot. So yeah, the base really does come from the, the apples and the onions, the, like the, the structure of the soup. So you want to make sure you're blending all those guys in. And again, just be careful that it's hot. Get it on the blender. Thank you. 
So I'm just gonna pour it into my bowl right here. And so it smells like fall and autumn here. So it's a little bit hard to, to see, but it's nice and creamy and velvety. And then I'm just gonna top it with the nuts and the apples and the chipolini onions and that's it. So just kind of incorporate them right into the soup itself. And then I'll try to show you the finished product. Somebody's asking if the soup will thicken over time. So it will set up a little bit more once it gets cold. So you can always add a little bit more liquid. So, or just a little bit more water. You could even add a little bit of apple juice if you wanna just keep that apple intense flavor there so that you don't lose anything. When it's hot right now, it's not gonna be as thick as once it sets up. So keep that in mind too. If you like your soups, if you like to eat them cold, you might wanna uh, add a little less water or you might wanna add a little bit more water in the beginning so that once it sets up, it's at a, the right texture if you don't want it to be too thick and like a puree, you want it to still be soupy. So let's see, this is my final product right here. So you can see the garnish is floating on top. It's got a golden brown color and it smells like the season for sure. Yum, well, that, well that's delicious. Yeah, Very so healthy. yeah. Exactly. You can enjoy both these dishes too in the, in the same meal. They've, they've got very complimentary flavor profiles. So start with the soup, finish it up with the dessert. I know so many chefs because of, you know, the complexity of their jobs that like sometimes on the day off, they just want to eat a bowl of cereal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely can go to that sometimes, but it's really nice to have like something like this is so easy to make too. If you make it in bulk and just store it in the freezer, which sometimes I try to remember to do when I have a little extra energy on a day off. It's really nice to, to feel nourished by your own flavors as well, instead of not taking care of yourself on a day off. I am very guilty of doing that. I'll order takeout a lot. I'll be super lazy, but doing something like this is so satisfying. And when you're doing it for yourself, sometimes, like sometimes in a kitchen, you get a little bit lost amongst everything, especially as an executive chef. Now you're running a, a whole operation. So you miss out on kind of the joys of the and intri intricacies of just cooking something delicious and beautiful and getting to experience it when it's warm, when it's ready to eat and at the right time. So it's nice to take a little bit extra time to replenish your energy on a day off for sure. Very cool. Well, this is a wonderful presentation and how can people get to know you more and follow you more? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram. My handle is at C-H-E-F chef and then Lecky, L-E-C-I, a nickname from growing up years ago. And you can also find me at my website, www.syncopatednyc.com. And if you're in New York City, you can certainly stop by Balabusta. It's on West 12th and Hudson Street. I'm there almost every day. We're closed on Mondays, but you can often find me there every other day of the week. That's a fun name for a restaurant. Well, thank you, Chef Alexis. Yes, thank you so much. It's been such a joy being here and sharing my story with you. Yeah, you did a wonderful job. And thank you, Mom and Dad, for referring your lovely daughter to the show. And thanks all of you, the viewers, for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. The show will be one hour earlier tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And my guest is the author of The Hungry Brain, Dr. Stephanie.